Hey guys, and welcome back to Mad About Skin. In today's video, we are continuing the Evolution Of series here on the channel, where I break down the history of some of the most popular skincare brands. I've already covered The Ordinary, The Inky List, and Mario Badescu, and I've pulled all of those videos together in a playlist, which I'll link up there if you've missed any of them. Today is the turn of Paula's Choice, one of the biggest skincare brands globally, who, until recently, could do no wrong. Over the past couple of years, the brand has come under increased scrutiny and challenge, and we're gonna kind of pull it all apart and look how we went from the 1995 innovative new launch of Paula's Choice through to today where it's become a multinational corporation. I want you to sit back, relax as we talk the history of Paula's Choice. Now I've got an awful lot to say when it comes to Paula's Choice. They've been around for decades so there's a lot to unpack. Filming these videos is so so much fun doing all the research, looking into the background of these brands but it's also quite time consuming so if you could do me a huge, huge favour and reach down and give this video a big thumbs up and a like. Honestly it supports me and the channel so so much and I would love you forever. I have been so overwhelmed by the love and support that you guys have shown to this series. Like I say it's super fun to create and knowing that you guys are really really enjoying it honestly it just means the world to me so thank you. Now, without further ado, shall we cut the waffle and just delve straight on in? Because we have to go all the way back to 1995 to look at the start of Paula's Choice. Paula's Choice was created by Paula Bagu, which the brand is named after. Now, while she created it in 1995, at this point, Paula wasn't actually a novice in the skincare world. She actually had over a decade's worth of experience in cosmetic and beauty industry under her belt by this point. She got herself a little bit of a reputation as being the cosmetics cop. The one that kind of called out some of the shady practices in the skincare world and really went under the skin of brands and called out some of the bad formulations, the dodgy business practices. I love the idea of like the cosmetics cop because you know what, these sort of practices still go on today and it's really good that we as the consumer are a little bit more informed thanks to people like Paula who called this out where she saw it. Paula was also a very prolific author so she had her first book which was called Blue Eyeshadow Should Be Illegal. I'm not gonna lie, I kind of agree with her on that one but you know sound off in the comment section below blue eyeshadow yay or nay that was a huge huge hit and I think really launched her career she followed that with a book don't go to the cosmetics counter without me which still today is an international bestseller this was kind of like a no holds barred look at the beauty industry different ingredients formulations which meant that us the consumer really had the first opportunity we had to read about what different ingredients would do how they interacted with our skin so we knew what we were looking out for when we went to the beauty counter I kind of love that. I know nowadays we kind of get all our information online so this style of book isn't really necessary anymore. At the time it was groundbreaking, super innovative and I think this is why a lot of people fell in love with Paula. She also did a lot of other books about the best places to snog globally. I, I Yeah, that, that one was a little bit baffling and I don't know how she really had that alongside her cosmetics influences and industry. And I don't know but if you google Paula Begum books you'll see a whole array of different topics from, like I say, international snogging through to ingredients and that real focus down on what's good for our skin and what's not. I think she transformed the consumer understanding of what they wanted to put on their skin. And for this, I think we're still paying dividends and should be eternally, eternally grateful. Having been an international bestseller, she reinvested some of the profits from all her books into creating the Paula's Choice skincare line. And honestly, from day one, it was an instant, instant hit. Her philosophy was always that good skincare should never be a luxury. And this is something that I really, really pride myself, again, on the channel and the content that I create. Because I think for too long, brands have told us you need to spend more in order to get more. And this just isn't the case. And I think Paula's Choice really started to challenge this narrative to say, actually, you can pay affordable for the formulation price points and still get some really, really great results. And she led from the fore with her own brand. She also said that there's no need for certain ingredients and certain formulations that brands tell us we need to have. Things such as eye creams, which she described as just over priced moisturizers and generally I think that still holds true today she said no you won't find that in my skincare line because I'm only going to be delivering ingredients and products that have proven ability to transform our skin and they've been peer-reviewed whilst that might not sound as revolutionary today back then honestly I think she was probably the only one that was actually doing this on a large scale in the industry you could tell from the start that this was Paula's baby she was the face the brains 
the image behind the whole brand. And you could tell that her philosophy that she'd supported throughout all her books and her writing really came through in this brand. And this is, I think, one of the biggest reasons why it was such an international success. Where's the consumer? We can see when someone is just putting a cash grab out there. This definitely wasn't the case with Paula. The philosophy that she'd supported and promoted for years was there, front and center in her brand. And it kind of is one of the reasons why I absolutely love the brand. We'll come on to how this evolved and changed later on in the video, but I think from its launch right the way through to 2008, this is a really, really strong brand. So we're going to have to skip forward like the best part of 10 years. You know, over this period, a lot did happen. New product launches. Obviously, the brand grew and grew and grew in scale. Paula became even more internationally renowned as like being that cosmetics cop saying you can buy my line with confidence, knowing that you're getting great formulations at a fantastically reasonable price point for what we're delivering. Then we reached 2008 with the launch of Beautypedia, a website that's still going strong today. And a lot of you guys might actually reach to Beautypedia for reviews on well known skincare products. I know it's one that I used to use quite a lot until I had understood a little bit more about the brand itself. Beautypedia was kind of designed to be the online version of the Don't Go to the Cosmetics Counter Without Me book. It listed all of the skincare ingredients, what they did, whether they were good guys or bad guys in your formulation, and kind of what skin types they were suitable for. It also hosted thousands upon thousands of reviews of individual skincare products. It was like a one-stop shop for all your skincare needs. You knew exactly what you were buying as a consumer. And whilst there are other um, websites now, such as the Inky Decoder, that do very similar things, at the time, again, Beautypedia was pretty innovative and like one of a kind in the web space. 2008 and the launch of Beautypedia, however, was the first time I think there was actually criticism leveled against Paula's choice as a brand. That's because they featured their products alongside the other ones they were reviewing on this website. Now, some people call this out and said, actually, how can you be objective if you're comparing your own products to others in the market, surely you're going to show yours in a good light and then be giving everyone else a more negative review, again, to boost your own sales. This, unfortunately, was kind of proven to be what was actually happening with a lot of employees, disgruntled employees, admittedly, coming out and saying they kind of felt pressured into writing bad reviews about certain products whilst writing glowing reviews of the Paula's Choice range. If you went on Beautypedia at this time as well, it was glaringly obvious that this was what was happening. You looked up any of the Paula's Choice products and it was five star reviews, no bad word to say about them. This actually just isn't realistic. You know, even the very best products out there will have the odd detractor, the odd person that it didn't work for to have 100% glowing feedback it's just not realistic or real life. And you could see that this was being manipulated. Some people said, actually, this isn't an issue. It's their website. They could do what they want with it. And this is certainly true. But I think when you're trying to be like the good guy in the industry, the cop, the one that calls out other brands shady behavior, when you start engaging in that, I think it kind of damages your reputation. And this is the first point, I think, where people start to say, Paula's Choice might not be as globally, universally like holy grail and good as maybe they wanted us to believe they were. They were still under the counter doing some of these practices they were calling out other brands for. In her defense, Paula came back and said, actually, she was one of the few brands that was actually reviewing, in a positive light in a lot of cases, other brands' products. It wasn't that only her products got five-star reviews. She was actually giving five-star reviews to other brands as well. So, you know what? I do see both sides to this. And I think she weathered the storm relatively well. You know, this was 2008. A lot of people were still navigating the online world. It wasn't such a big thing as it is today. And I think people were willing to look past this because, again, it's still the brand still held true to its values and its ethos and people are still very much invested and bought into that and I think you know what whilst there was a little bit of controversy surrounding the launch of Beautypedia Paula and the brand itself weathered this and they just glided through to 2012 where I think this is where things really started to change now in 2012 this is where Paula sold the brand for a reported 70 million dollars now I sometimes take these with a pinch of salt these figures while 70 million dollars was the generally understood amount in the press that the brand was sold for. I think sometimes these can be manipulated up or down. So who knows the true figure? Only Paula really because she was the one that cashed that check. But she sold and she stepped back entirely from the company. She was no longer involved in the formulations, the direction, any new product launches. She was, I think, linked in either some sort of like marketing or deal to kind of still be the face of the brand when they wanted her to be. But she really didn't have the say that she or the control that she had prior to this point. Now, as with a lot of buyouts, things do change. And certainly this 
this was the case with Paula's choice. Let's start with the positives, or what I think are the positive changes that came out of this. First and foremost, they did a whole rebrand, and I think this was actually needed. At this point, if you look at the old style Paula's Choice products, which you can Google, they'd become a little bit dated and a little bit tired looking because the packaging hadn't changed since the launch in 1995. Obviously, tastes, printing had all evolved since then. So I think the more streamlined, sleek look of the products that the buyout actually created, you know what, I think was to the brand's credit. And certainly people started to pay more attention. New followers of the brand were found attracted by this sleek new packaging design. Unfortunately, I think that's pretty much where the positives end. And actually, a lot of things started to change at this point. First and foremost was the price. So Paula had always said, you know, drugstore is where it's at when it comes to skincare. That doesn't mean like rock bottom pricing, but a fair price point for the formulation that the brand is offering. And I think to this point, it was undeniable that with a really good, gorgeously formulated product, Paula's Choice was available at a really accessible price point. This changed and over the next four years, the price rose on average 35%. That's a pretty significant jump. This again takes us through to 2016 when the big change happened. So this was actually sold again for a reported $280 million. So over that period of time, the popularity, the growth of the brand had allowed it to evolve and certainly be sold for a higher price point to a brand named TA Associates. This is where things really, really took, in my view, a negative turn. So they said, okay, we've got this new brand. We've paid top dollar for it and we want to get every last bit of profit out there and they decided that they were going to do away with the original founding philosophies of Paula herself. You know some people said enough time had elapsed from the foundation. Paula was no longer involved in the brand. It just had her name and actually very few people at this point according to the brand itself knew who Paula was. I don't know how truthful that is. You know she still had a cult following of hardcore fan base. I think since the rebrand that happened a couple of years earlier there was a lot of new followers that knew Paula's choice as a brand but maybe didn't know the founder Paula or her original philosophy. This might ring true, but they said because so few, few people actually knew who Paula was at this point, they could kind of do away with some of the original philosophies and just really use the brand to maximize profit and deliver what the consumer wants. So they set about transforming the brand. They did another little rebranding tweak to the look and the image of the products, but they started to increase the number of products available. And honestly, they did this at speed. I think the thing that alarmed most people, at least the hardcore holy grail cult followers of the brand was that they introduced an eye cream. Now, this might not seem like totally revolutionary. Most brands have an eye cream, but Paula was so anti-eye creams, just decrying them as being overpriced moisturizers, that the fact that this TA Associates launched an eye cream as one of the first products after their buyout really shocked a lot of people. And I think signified that they completely severed the ties with the original philosophy of Paula and the real original ethos of the brand itself. The eye cream also wasn't that great. It kind of was just an overpriced moisturizer, which again, I think fed into this narrative that things were really changing at a quick pace. They also introduced mineral oil into a lot of their products, which Paula again was really quite against in her original writings and her original work said that really mineral oil was problematic for so many different skin types. It really wasn't worth as an ingredient, including in skincare. Well, it's cheap to formulate with and TA Associates thought, you know what? Most people don't care that much about uh, mineral oil. Let's put it in there and just, you know, hope that nobody really notices. And people didn't. Sales continued to grow and grow and grow. Unfortunately, so did the price point. Having just gone up by 35% over a period of four years, the price increase escalated yet further. Over the next four years, TA Associates increased the average price point of one of the Paula's Choice products by 40%. So at this point, we've practically doubled the cost when you look at like six or seven years ago. This is a lot of people say, is this actually value for money? This is at the point I really started to look at Paula's Choice and think, yeah, this is pretty pricey as a brand. And then when you look back to what the original price point was, I think that shows into sharp relief uh, just how many increases there've been. They also shrunk the size of a lot of products. Now, shrinkflation, I think, is the correct economic term for this. It's something that a lot of brands do. Normally, they keep the price the same, but shrink the size of the product. So you're getting less for that same price point. It's kind of the same as a price increase, but it looks less noticeable to us, the consumer, because we pay a lot more attention to price and less to the amount of fluid ounces or whatever that you're actually getting of the product. Now, Paula's Choice actually did both. Increase the price, minimize the such the size of the product. This pretty shady, honestly, and I don't know any other brands that really do this. They kind of do one or the other. Polish Choice thought, no, let's rinse every last dime and dollar of profit that we can get out of this. And this was clearly TA Associates' approach. They also launched 
so many new products at this point. It grew and grew and grew. I think prior to the buyout, Paula's Choice had four different cleansers. This is quite normal. Your different cleansers work differently on different skin types and they had a nice range of formulations to suit everybody. This increased to 30 seven. Now that's thinking, at this point, 37 different cleansers. Now, different ones were available in different markets, so it wasn't that you could get your hands on all 37 of them, but this is a massive, massive increase. And honestly, I don't think there was a whole lot of difference between each of the formulations to really justify this. Paula herself always said that skincare should kind of be simple, easy to understand, and there is nothing simplistic about having to navigate your way through 37 different cleansers to work out which is the right one for you. They all had different price points, they all had different packages, packaging, they had different names. It was totally, totally baffling and confusing. But like I say, I think TA Associates had decided that so few people actually knew who Paula, the brand was named after at this point. It really didn't matter. Let's just rinse every last bit of profit that we can get out of it. And they weren't really focused down on the quality of the formulations. A lot of people still continue to buy Paula's Choice because the original products hadn't changed a whole lot. So the old Holy Grails were still Holy Grails for a lot of people, including the now infamous Paula's Choice Skin Perfecting liquid exfoliant, which hadn't changed in like a decade and people still adored. We then moved to 2020 where things went crazy. This is where YouTube and then subsequently TikTok really just propelled the brand into like the stratosphere in terms of its sales. So many influencers really, really latched onto the brand and how amazing they thought it was for the skin. This was actually a deliberate. TA Associates said, we are wanting to work more with influencers. We think this is the direction that marketing and promotion is going in. And we're going to send all of our products to all these influencers, pay for sponsorships to really get the brand name out there. They did again another small tweak to the range and to the look of the products to really appeal to a younger demographic. Prior to this point, I think the average Paula's Choice consumer was a lady in her 30s, 40s, and 50s. They wanted to shrink that down. They wanted it to be more gender neutral so that guys would buy at the same rate as girls. They launched a Paula's Choice men's collection and they really wanted to shrink the demographic age down. They appealed to the teens, to the 20s, and this was really, really apparent in the influencer marketing they did around this point. Also, somebody has to pay for all this advertising and sponsorship that they were doing. So again, the price point went up again by around 15 to 20% in this thing. I agree, you know, capitalize on your success when you have it. But again, just rinsing the consumer for another extra coin, extra dollar, seems really tacky at this point. And this is why in certain countries, particularly here in the UK, where the Polar's Choice is much more expensive than say in North America, you look at these products and they're just not worth that price point. They also did something that Paula said she would never, never do, and that's start to have discounts and sales. This is something that a lot of brands do do. They hike the price point of their products up so much. And then when they think, ooh, people are getting a little wise to this, oh, let's do a coupon code, let's do a sale. This is definitely something that was seen more in the US than here in Europe. But definitely every so often they'll do a sale to kind of just bring that price point down. Paula's philosophy was always just sell it at a fair price in the first place, which is something I definitely, definitely agree with. You know, a little money off here and there around the holidays is all a great thing. But to have to do this consistently to flog your products, I think takes advantage of those people that have paid full price for the products. And this is definitely something that you started to see happen a lot more so post 2020 up to today. Again, the product line grew and grew and grew. They do tinted lip balms now. That's something that I think launched around 2020. They do even more exfoliators or versions of their cult holy grail liquid exfoliator than they did before. I think we're up to like six or seven versions of it. And they started to increase the concentrations and offer higher concentration versions of all their products, which actually, you know, for a lot of people, caused redness, sensitivity, peeling, and really went against what the science was saying. This is definitely the case with niacinamide, where you can buy a 20% niacinamide serum, where if you read the science, all data shows that it works best at between a 2 and a 5% concentration. Paula was all about the science following the data to give maximum benefits with minimum risk of irritation. That clearly, again, has been done away with with this new buyout. We then fast forward ever so slightly to 2021, where Unilever, really impressed with how much Paula's Choice were growing and growing and growing, decided to buy the brand for a reported 700 million dollars. So you can see we've gone from 70 to 300 to 700 million dollars. This is a brand that's just growing and growing and growing. And Unilever are really keen, apparently according to their press release anyway, to buy the brand because of their online digital focus. A lot of Polish Choice products are sold online, which is still relatively rare. You know, most of these big brands still do a lot of their sales in physical stores, but Unilever wanted to get into that digital market and Polish Choice seemed a really good fit. We don't really know what direction Unilever are going to take the brand 
in. If I was going to guess, I'd say more price increases, more product launches, and honestly, a further removal from Paula's original vision for the brand itself. Where are we now? Let's just sit down and thought, where, where have we got to? We've kind of seen the evolution. Where does that leave us now? I think if I was a skincare shopper in 1995, I would definitely have bought into the Paula's Choice brand. The price point was amazing. It was something really innovative and disruptive in the industry. And Paula had a really, really firm grip on what she actually wanted the brand to be and delivered that effortlessly. I think I would have been like a real stand for the brand back then. Today, no. I genuinely don't think Paula's Choice is actually worth the price point that they're asking for. And that's because that increase on increase on increase. Now, there will be people out there that say Paula's Choice works beautifully for their skin and they wouldn't be without it. If that's the case, continue to use it. If it fits with your budget and your skin's needs. But I think people are feeling increasingly priced out of the Paula's Choice bracket. When they're asking for like double the amount that they were asking for like five or six years ago, that's when I think it becomes price gouging rather than, you know, just taking account of inflation. Coupled with the fact that a lot of their products have shrunk in size, I just think we're so far removed from Paula's original philosophy that I just really, really don't feel comfortable shopping with the brand today. I would love to know what your thoughts, feelings and opinions, having seen what the product has evolved from and to, do you have any holy grails that you wouldn't be without? Or have you decided that honestly, it's not worth the price point they want to charge? Sound off in the comment section below with your thoughts, feelings and opinions to Paula's choice. And wherever you are in the world, guys, stay safe, stay well, love your skin. Take care. Bye.